I'm here today with the wonderful and amazing Clive Deemer, who of course has been working with Radiohead for over 10 years, other great musicians like Portishead, who I'm sure many know, uh, Robert Plant, and many, many others. Um, he's coming to us today from a secret location in the UK. Thank you so much, Clive, for joining us today. My pleasure. You know, I want to start off with a little bit of a story, which is kind of how I got into your music. And okay. I was walking around one time, I was in a marching band when I was in high school. And this was the early, early 2000s. And I was known for whacking the hell out of my drums. <laughs> and uh, as everyone in marching band is, I know they probably don't have as many in the UK, but it's a very big thing here in Canada and the US. But yeah, right, yeah. we had a big extended break in the middle of the day and I would go to a record store and pick up records. And this was around the time that Hail to the Thief had come out and, and some of Portishead's albums have been out for a few years. Right. And I would go home at the end of a lot of nights and you know practice drumming and do these things. But I picked up Dummy um, and I remember the first track on there, I was like, finally, this is a groove that I was like, wait a minute, I can't just sit down and play this like a 2-4 beat. This is a really cool groove. And it sort of awoke me to the idea that the drumming was as much a part of a band or could be as much of a part of a band as the rest of the instruments. And so this really did inspire me on my journey to, I, I have a clarinet performance degree, but I also play percussion and drumming and, and uh, just everything about sort of the, the playing that goes on in Portishead's music is to me very interesting, but also Radiohead's. So when the two kind of came together in 2011, I was, as I'm sure many Radiohead fans were, pretty elated. So I don't think they could have picked a better drummer to work with. I love everything that you've done. I think you've done great work. Um, but yeah, I'd love to just sort of dive in, first of all, to everyone knows you as a drummer. And if they don't, go look it up. We're not going to waste time talking about that here. But I want to dive into you as like a nuanced player, studio player, and sort of just get into sort of the music of Portishead and then we'll talk a bit of, of well, Radiohead a bit later, so. Yeah, the marching band thing. Uh, yeah, that doesn't really happen over here. I mean, it does exist oh. here, but I know yeah. I, in, in the Canada, in the States, it's, it's a big thing and, and uh, that whole tradition. Uh, and and I, I, when I was working with Robert Plant, I, I um, uh, got to hear some of the, the, the two sort of strains of that. So, you know, that, that military uh, marching tradition that also became the 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 delta fife and drum thing the funkier end of things uh which kind of relates to some of the things we might end up talking about further into this discussion i suspect yeah and you know i notice in, in many of your recordings you do tend to play traditional grip so i have a feeling that's more from a jazz background but i was going to ask if you were ever in a marching type band when you were younger and it sounds like uh, the no, hard no. No. <laughs> no, no i wasn't and um and the, and uh, as often is the case with me is there are lots of contradictions when i started in the mid 70s uh, as a long haired rock fan i was you know a a a, 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 a you know a, a thumping matched grip basher to start off with uh and uh you know very loud and would break things on a drum kit uh and and then um yeah, cut a very very long story short when, when i discovered that the 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 uh the, the the magic of being able to play quietly um that's when i really did start to under to get very genuinely curious about jazz and that's when i started to try and do traditional grip and once i got it which took me about i've been playing about 10 years at that point and when i switched back to to traditional um yeah about a year in i'm so glad i did because it, it it completely gave me a whole new out sort of musical outfit of clothes to wear so to speak you know um and that's the, that all fed into what i do with portis head and, and others could you elaborate on that a little bit like i think that some people think that drummers often play traditional grip usually they're non-drummers but they think they do it to look cool and it does look cool <laughs> but what do, you cool, mean, yeah. what do you mean as far as the different um kind of nuances you can get lots of things look look cool when a drummer <laughs> is playing something with true conviction yes you know when a, like in the 70s when you started to see a lot more people playing match grip compared with what would have usually have been traditional if it's if they're playing well with 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 conviction and with real musicality either one can look and be and sound cool um but i to me the difference between match grip and traditional is there's a circular feeling that starts to come into your playing when you use traditional grip um, which, which sort of it's kind of doesn't make sense, but to me that's what it feels like. And when I once I started doing the Porter's Head records, I started then to discover 
a dynamic level of playing, you know, in terms of power, less mm-hmm. volume, way, way lower than anything I'd ever experienced before. And that, again, fed into well, everything I've done ever since. Because before I was super loud, like most young teenagers on a drum kit, super, super loud. And and I, I before I started the Portishead thing, I'd, I'd gotten into jazz and was envious of uh, watching acoustic musicians being able to play. And that age old problem of when a drummer tries to join in, they can't a lot of the time because they don't know how to play quietly. And I was determined to crack that problem. And Porter's head, funny enough, was one of the outcomes of me trying to get to that place. Do you think some of it has to do with the difference in the muscle groups between the different hand positions? And for those who don't know, matched is, of course, when the hands look the same. And traditional yeah. is when one drummer is holding. Yes. Yeah, matched grip. Yeah, so a symmetrical, you know, identical grip for both hands. Traditional, which comes from the marching snare drummers and the, which fed into jazz. That's that's the difference. Yeah, muscles, obviously muscles are a big part of it. But um, I did quite a lot of uh, martial arts and Tai Chi many years ago. Um, particularly Tai Chi taught me some of the basic principles. Anyone who's studied in that stuff will tell you that um, a lot of the, in a lot of the Chinese schools of how you move, it's about mental intent and having the right tension in the right place, but nowhere else. There's a Bruce Lee thing, there's a martial arts thing where the arm is considered to be like a piece of wire. The grip of the fist is like a, a rock, but yeah. the arm is loose and can and transfer a lot of power and speed because you're not tensing up all the muscles. You're not wasting energy. You're, you're not blocking yourself. And once I understood how to do that from Tai Chi, I applied that into the drum kit. So I'm not gripping the sticks really tight. It's just like just the con- enough tension in the fingers to not let go of the sticks. Everything else is let go, I let go. Um, and that was another part of being able to play some of the things that I play. Drum and bass stuff that I did later on was, was, was uh, affected by that. Yeah, and you know, it's not really asymmetrical just from the way you look at it. I, I see what you mean as far as also kind of maybe the sound quality that one can produce or the feel of playing or the grooves. And and uh, there was another interview, I forget the guy's name right now, but you were talking a bit about this this nuanced playing and how you can get so much more sound out of the drums in a studio but i thought it was very interesting because you had also said that one of the reasons drums got progressively louder in rock music is because of the amps and of course the guitars and in the guitar era um so it's interesting to me how as music has moved on we've gone almost back to a studio type of playing um that has carried over then into live because of now additional amplification and i wonder if we could just talk about how this sort of has rolled back on itself like you're able now to play softer because of a studio whereas yeah. before more bands were recording in a live setting just straight into the microphones so yeah there's a lot of questions in that yes question. yes many but, questions um, there. sorry then, all right to try and simplify it yes uh, my, so as i just said i started in the mid 70s okay so uh, the especially when you're young you want to be powerful you want to be dynamic it's a natural feeling that you have when you're young because you have tons of you know vim and you're you know you're you're taking on the world full face and rock music expressed a lot of that by the time i started to discover the really good jazz or what i personally felt was really good jazz i started to realize that there was a whole musicality within um the great jazz drummers um that you don't get with rock drummers although john bonham is an exception i'd say and earl palmer who inspired john bonham um so once the the amplifier and the electric guitar arrived in the what the early fifties, um, the vo- the dynamic volume of a band started to get pushed into a place that it hadn't been before. So um, jazz drummers who p- could play with acoustic instruments, um, that dynamic was left behind, and then the whole idea of power. In, in rock music and rock and roll got bigger and bigger and bigger and drum kits got louder and drummers got louder. Uh, and now, um, so so there's this, a lot of drummers, young drummers make the mistake of thinking that if they play louder and louder and more powerful when they're recording, it will sound more and more powerful. The reverse is often more true. It's it, to get a, a more intent, more intensity from the sound of a drum kit. Sometimes actually playing quieter means that the mics can get a better sound 
and you have more control of it. So when you mix it, you can expand that sound and make it sound even more, uh, um, uh, uh, more powerful. Uh, I've already lost the plot of what your question was. But it's exactly but, what yeah. I love about the Porter set, the first groove on Mr. Ons, um, right. a little kind of crescendo in the drum roll. Yes. And that to me was wow. quite jarring because like I said, I was used to just sitting down and being like, all right, I, I can play a two and four groove. Like I can play 90% of what's on the radio, <laughs> but this right. song I have to think about. And that just kind of, wait a second. <laughs> so yeah. that dynamic range in the percussion part of the drumming part was very, very cool. And, uh, I, and I know that was recorded very, very. I was playing very quietly when I when I recorded that. Almost sneakily. Uh, yeah, very, because um, uh, to get the sound, um, uh, uh, there was a thing going on between Jeff Barrow and I when we were in the studio where um, I didn't have it on some of the first ones I did with them. I can't remember which way around it worked, but somewhere in that period, I discovered these particular sticks. They're uh, the Zildjian model, uh, Hal Blaine model. And that's what he used to use. And it's got a really sensitive tip. It's probably the shortest stick you can get. It's skinny as hell. It's like a little jazz stick, you know. But pencils. when you're recording, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, like pencils, right? Um, and um, I think of it like the difference between using a teaspoon or a, or a spade. Mm, yeah. If you, okay, so if you think of opening up a, a soft boiled egg, you use a teaspoon. You wouldn't get a spade to try and tap the eggshell and remove it, it would be too big. That's like a giant drumstick and you're trying to play quietly and get subtlety and, yeah. and right, really low volume dynamic. And it's the same with the stick. So if the stick is shorter and thinner, the whole, all the uh, um, velocity and the, 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 uh, what's the, the, the pivot of the stick is changed. So you're working in a, with a smaller movements and the whole sound level is brought down, which means the microphones can come in better or be have more gain on them, get more sound. And that Porter's Head drum sound is built out of some of that stuff. There are other things in, in the mix that makes it make it sound the way the, the tuning of the kit, what the kit was, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's the principle. And I and once I learned that from making those records, probably every other session that I do, I, I'm using that. Uh, technique uh, to get a drum sound that a lot of people don't get. Totally. And I think that it makes the, the whole groove, especially on that first track, it's just iconic. The first five seconds, you know what you're listening to. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, that kind of groove is so hard to achieve and accomplish. And I think for those listening, like, especially those who maybe don't know uh, a lot outside of, um, you know, your work with Radiohead, I imagine there's listeners who are newer and have, have uh, never delved so much into that, that late nineties kind of Porter's head trip hop stuff. Um, do look into it for sure, but it's important to realize that you've established yourself as this level of player long before your involvement with Radiohead. And I think that um, that's worth focusing on just a little more before we do dive into the, the okay. work you've done in the latter section of your career here. Um, so talk to me a bit about how you as a drummer feel that drummers today can try to find their own sort of uniqueness to the sound also with incorporating technology, because as I was just saying, it's so easy to just sit down and another drummer who's solely rock based might have looked at that song and just sat there and played a totally boring, normal groove. But you came up with something really amazing and interesting. So how do you bridge that gap and find uniqueness as a player? Um, it's really it's the age old things. Um, it's it's using your ears properly. You have to listen. Uh, a lot of drummers don't listen very well. They they hear a beat and they try and try and play it, and they might copy the notes, but they don't nuance and phrase it. They don't make it speak mm. the way it was done. So I mean, a lot of things that I do when I I get asked to do master classes or you know uh, presentations for students, I I try to get them to realize that um, even if you're asked to do a session and it's some you know a a boring pop song just a straight 4-4 four, four, and all they want from you is a really simple beat. You must still engage with those basic elements, the hi-hat, the bass drum and the snare drum. And you must think about how you're balancing the sound of those three, those three elements and, and the attitude with which you're playing it, how much you engage with it emotionally while you're doing it. 
at the risk of sounding a bit like a kind of actor, theatrical <laughs> lovey here. But that genuinely is what I do. It's often like an acting role. It's like, well, what are the drums saying here? Are they, are they saying something that's sneaky? You just use that word. Are they, are they being bombastic and powerful? Is it some other word that describes the mood, the feeling that the drum kit is providing to the song? And, um, you know, anyone who's played a while knows that, you know, just the simple differences between putting a stick on a hi-hat cymbal, which I don't think you can see in this picture, but so if you put the tip on, you get this really fine, you know, delicate sound. And then when you use the shoulder, you get this tonal change, you know. And just deciding how much of that you use in relation to the bass drum and the snare drum part is going to have a an, an effect on on the way it sounds, the way it feels, um, uh, and all of that, the stuff that I'd learned to do a lot of that f many years before I did the Polish Head records, and it was only because of Jeff's ear as well, Jeff Barrow's ear, who particularly wanted to get these certain kind of grooves um, that we were able to meet in the middle, where he could tell me, well, can yeah, but can you play it so it sounds a bit more like this or a bit more like that. And I was able to to tailor the the playing so that he got what he was imagining. So I feel like a lot of drummers then maybe think of kind of what to put on each beat, and you're more describing like how to put on each beat. Yeah, it's both yeah. things, of course. Yeah, I mean yeah, sometimes yeah. you're presented with a you know come up with a beat for my song, please. Yeah. So <laughs> then then it's the same old thing. Yeah. What do I have an idea? You know, that's another conversation again. But yeah. you, as soon as you've got the beat, you must then straight away ask yourself, am I playing this the best way? Could I play this slightly differently that would help? Just the simple difference between playing something in straight quarter notes or making them swing yeah, a little bit or a lot. I, I've been in sessions where someone started up with play, you know, they put the track on and they think they're going to get. You know, but if I suddenly would say, well, yeah, but I could play like that, or I could play. Yeah, yeah. I could swing those beats. Just moving between swing, swung and, and straight can sometimes transform a, a, a track. Totally. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things, and once you start talking about it, it kind of it sounds very simple, but it kind of blossoms out into all kinds of possibilities. Well, I've heard drummers describe playing melodically before, but generally, it's more I don't want to say uh, well, it's a little less involved. Like you're talking about the high tom versus the low tom and the snare, but you're talking like literally you use the hi hat to demonstrate this, which I find very interesting <laughs> because it's such a you know such a high frequency that most people just consider to be a little click in the background. Yeah, you're exactly. Putting right. a a real level of thought into it which is just amazing yeah and and for the same reason so a lot of things I, i've often said to other drums is when you are playing what on the face of it might seem like a simple recognizable beat or a common sounding beat you think about if one of those elements the bass drum the snare drum or the hi-hat is somehow dominant to the other two you know so if i if, if i'm just playing a 4-4 four, four beat and then i make one of them louder I'm not, this is not mic'd up properly for drums, but yeah, no, I hear it though. Make the bass drum loud, too loud for this mic in this instance, but immediately I'm suggesting something. I'm I'm creating a, you know, some kind of potential drama. The same with the snare drum. A lot of drummers just whack the hell out of the snare drum. They never seem to think about well. How loud should the snare drum be in this this beat? You know, just just changing those three basics, which is the first thing that uh, the the guy will do when you do your session and you've been whacking the hell out of a drum kit, and he's probably been thinking, "Oh God, the guy's banging everything too loud and too many." <laughs> He's going to just completely pull everything down on the faders and rebalance everything you played. So if you are musical, if you think musically enough and get into the, the song enough and give him imply a mixed outcome of the drum kit while you're recording, he'll probably 
fall for it a bit like yeah, it's a bit like the Jedi mind trick. You know? you're saying, hey, wouldn't it yeah, sound yeah. really good if the snare drum was a bit louder than everything else? And by the time you've let, nailed the track, he'll probably leave it like that. He may even enhance that because that's what you said. That's how you said it at the time. Yeah, you want the recording engineer, I guess, to be excited about turning you up, not wanting to turn you down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's what I find often happens when I, when I do stuff with people. If I, when I play quieter, generally speaking, we call quieter, I usually find that when it's mixed, the drums are way further up in the mix than you, you know. That's amazing, though. I hope those listening can hear, too. I definitely hear the different qualities in the drums. And next time I sit down with a kid, I'm really going to you know, think about this. But um, let's talk a bit about just the, the, the technology that's integrated into drumming. Drumming is one of the very unique instruments, I think, in the mm -hmm. sense that it has involved technology. Like, I also play the clarinet. Um, there are no MIDI effects I can really add to my clarinet and things like that. But a lot of drummers now in their setup, they're including, you know, technology, whether it's running into a sampler or some kind of different uh you know rolling pads and things like that so how not only do you do this but how do you do it in a tasteful way that ends up sounding timeless um well the well it's funny but lots of people say this to me about me and technology really a lot of what i've done it there, there isn't that much of it i mean um uh Certainly not with Porter's Head. I've met a few other musicians from, you know, well-known bands or producers who came to see Porter's Head in the first sort of um, uh, um, first tours that they did when they became well-known. And a lot of people came along expecting to see a stage full of technology and equipment and, you know, uh, samplers and stuff. And when they got to the gig and saw a drummer, with a drum kit, a bass player, a guitar player, a keyboard player. <laughs> Only one person on the stage was doing the other stuff, and that was Jeff Barrow with all the stuff that he had created. And then obviously Beth. It was actually quite a conventional band. The only thing that marked it out was all the frequencies that didn't get used. So the way that Jeff Barrow pulled his head deal with a, P a PA system is not like, it's different to what everyone else does. They get rid of loads of frequencies that everybody tries to use. They actually limit the frequencies to get the sound. That's the first thing. Um, in Porter said I was firing off a few samples, but they weren't any nothing that's like particularly uh, remarkable. There's loads of other drummers out there doing that. Uh, with Radiohead, a little bit more because I did a bit more of that with them because they, they, there's so much more material that mm -hmm. it's such a broad musical church radiohead so there were sounds that specifically had to be on my roland spd pads yeah i think uh, sorry i was fast forwarding a bit to the picture that you sent oh. me, which is clearly of a radiohead setup <laughs> i think anyways i think i see the daydreaming lights in the background uh, okay maybe yeah, yeah yeah and so i think that i see a kind of a roland something yeah set up here but you're totally right about porter said in fact one of the really interesting things about that uh, roseland live album is they chose yeah. to start it with the orchestra's tuning note and I always think that's really interesting because when I listen to that, I'm like, okay, it sounds like we're about to listen to some little chamber music thing. Right. And in a way, it is chamber music, but it's just with new instruments and it's kind of cool. And, and Yeah, right. But you don't expect what happens really. And it's an interesting way to have started it off. Like here's something super traditional. And now yes. here's, I think it's humming that it starts with, <laughs> you know. It's a trick. It's kind of a trick. It's like, it, it, on the one hand, yeah, Portis Head kind of came up with this sound. Yes. Yeah. This, this sort of... Um, it's hard to find the words for it, but it, it, a very, very particular mood, a very particular atmosphere. Austere, maybe? I don't know. It's kind Austere, of- Austere, that's a good word for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, but when you boil it all down, it's really just about the texture and the tonal qualities and the frequencies that have been used, or more importantly, that have been removed. Mm. That's, you know, all, all of the sounds, you know, the, the, one of the, the terms that became popular at the time of, of um, uh, of it being lo-fi yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody started saying lo-fi which was a shorthand way of, of saying all that stuff but it's having the ear to to be aware of those things when you're making it that's that's the difference you know and it's getting away from the old from the the established tradition of being in a studio and having absolutely super duper uh um high fidelity sound <laughs> which yeah. for some things is great but in the from the poorest head starting point that's boring it's yeah. it's obvious and it's not very interesting um unless the source sound you're recording is interesting 
Well, I thought of a way to reword my question, which might make more sense. How do you avoid the temptation to just like go all into this sort of electronic drumming world then? Because if you're kind of sticking in the in the more acoustic realm, yeah, all this technology is available. I find that a lot of 80s bands, like you listen to it and you're like, oh, that's 80s music right away, just from all the synths and all the weird percussion sounds and, you know, all that stuff. But for me, like, I know some people would disagree with this, but Portishead and Radiohead and other bands, like, they don't have that that character where I listen and suddenly like, ah, this is 90s. I feel like it does sound kind of 90s, but if it came out yesterday, it would still be fresh. Yeah, right. It's, and that, that's a really, really um, fundamental um, thing of anything that's been made, that's been created, that genuinely has something different and unique about it. Um, Obviously, snare drums have been around forever, you know, but the snare drum sounds on the Portis Head records were recorded in such a way and processed and treated in such a way that by the time they were mixed and people heard them, they had a, this very radical sound to them. Um, and Radiohead and Portis Head both share that kind of awareness of the aesthetic of, a, of a, the choice of a sound, the choice of a chord, a chord structure. Uh, production quality they are really really good at, at at saying well we could use that sound and we could use that but no we we can't we can't use that because that sounds too much like those people or that suggests this kind of music we're not making that kind of music we have to think again we have to come up with something that's not like that so i guess to answer my own question it kind of seems like a lot of what me as a listener might interpret is electric electronic sounds or sampling and things like that is mostly done in post. Well, no, it's both. I mean, oh. um, I mean, one of my frustrations is that the Roland pad system is a great piece of kit and I, and I, and, I, and it's been fantastic to use. Um, but one of the things that, um, that I've never got around to doing is it's partly a frustration myself really is that I want to, uh, I, I keep talking about this and I never get time to do it. So some of the sounds that I use, which are not particularly radical that I have in my pads, mm -hmm. I want to get into the same world that a lot of guitar players get into where they have a really carefully worked out sequence of effects pedals that mm -hmm. creates a sound world that creates a set of sounds that would never ever have happened without that sequence of effects pedals. Ed O'Brien is a great example of that in Radiohead and some of the really, really baffling sounds on those records are ed o'brien not, like... not john not johnny yeah uh, you know you even so, know they're a guitar sometimes it's that's what makes them so amazing you cannot yeah. tell what they are at all and it wasn't until i started rehearsing with them that i discovered and i said it to him one day after ending a rehearsal a song i said it's you <laughs> you you're the one that makes all those sounds that everybody's going what is that instrument what is that yeah so you know, and that's that is uh, that's that's a creative creative choice that that you have to drive yourself to search for, and it takes a lot of time and effort and work to to come up with it. But once you get there, it's it's a great place to be. Well, Ed seems like such a kind man, and I do, I just I really appreciate both the guitarist and Radiohead for um, or all three, I suppose. Yeah. Or <laughs> depending, depending on how we look at it, <laughs> depending, depending on the date, depending yeah. on the song. <laughs> um, but I appreciate how all of them were able to s embrace like the, the new technology and the new music and the new style instead of being discouraged by that path. Like the whole kid A onwards is just so interesting to me, but um, I digress. Um, but yeah, no, I, I totally see what you mean. The Rage Against the Machine, his name, Tom Morello, is that his name? Yeah. The guitarist? Yeah. Wonderful yeah. example of this too, I think. Yeah. So heavy in the effects side, sometimes playing such a simple thing. And what comes out is just amazing. So, so you're saying you're someday hoping to incorporate this into your your setup, or? Well, I, I keep um, meaning to take my little pad setup to you know a, a shop that's got a really good collection of effects pedals, and bore the ass off them by spending an entire afternoon trying out all the pedals until I can find something like right. I'm definitely buying that pedal. I really love what that does. Yeah. And the next pedal, I've got to find the next pedal and the next. Um, I, I'm determined to do it. Um, I've been talking about it for years, but I, I still haven't got it together because I'm always so busy doing different things. So it, it's frustrating, but I've got to get there.
Well, let's move, let's move on to that second section of your, um, you know, saying busy, busy, busy. <laughs> I think the last 10 years probably got significantly busier uh, with the whole many tours with Radiohead and, and playing yeah. with, and recording. As you said, 2011 that started. Yeah. yeah, 2011 now. Is that, that's actually 12 years now. My God, where has the time gone? <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> 12 years yeah so let's talk a little bit about if you don't mind how this kind of came to be like i think that the merging of two of what i would think are the greatest drummers um to make some of this music is just such an interesting phenomenon and i it's interesting to me because the porter's head uh roseland recordings back in the day i think 1998 there was two drummers on that as well yeah that's right there was some some uh, um some overlap some moments yeah. I, can't remember. I haven't watched that thing for ages it's almost remember. like foreshadowing to me though it's like this can work and but it's strange because the average person listening to radiohead especially the the album versions they're going to hear some kind of you know interesting especially Kim, king of limbs era onward some very interesting tricky polyrhythmic crazy stuff yeah. but i imagine that if they came to a concert just like you're saying they would think they would see a drum machine or a looper or all this kind of stuff. And I think they would be surprised if they're not a keen fan to find that there's actually two drummers now in Radiohead to, to realize this music. So um, yeah, first I just wanna, if we could dive into a little bit, like what was that like to start working on the music, getting it into your repertoire, um, working on the arrangements and just bringing this music, which sort of existed in the studio to life at the beginning? Well, I've, I've talked about this before. I mean, when you go and listen to the King of Limbs, um, Bloom is the track that, that really kind of started the, the ball rolling with the whole idea. Um, and I think that is, uh, if I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, much of the, the, um, the dense, the dense polyrhythmic nature of that track, Bloom, was Johnny um, combining a whole load of um, loop um all kinds of loop um uh, tricks that he'd gotten into and you gotta remember johnny is always doing something with gear and sometimes when you ask well how did you do that johnny and, when, and unless you're really really technically savvy and i'm not up to speed with him by <laughs> you know uh, and often you'll get an explanation but i it, i wouldn't fully understand what he means you know unless i really you know pin him down so I know that he made that he they made a lot of that stuff in the studio, and it was only once they'd done it they realised how the hell are we going to re perform that because it wasn't performed. It was built in the studio out of various kind of technological trickery invention. So the 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 challenge was, Clive, can you work with Phil and try to kind of come up with a way of working together to create the vibe the atmosphere of, of of bloom so we have the spirit of that they weren't interested and this is an important thing they weren't interested in sort of having some um perfectionist sort of anal um just a straight reproduction of the record mm -hmm. and some people would try and repro reproduce it exactly like it is on the record they they didn't have that hang up so it was about having a polyrhythmic um dense a lot of things going on which is why you have johnny playing a floor tom and a snare drum obviously me and phil are on the kit so there's three drummers there again so anyway um and um it took us maybe three or four days of just philip and i just working together to find out how we could fit, knit things together and it, and it, it uh, emerged from that. Um, um, remind me again what the question was. It's just so interesting. Oh, now we're just kind of in the weeds, but <laughs> but I, I love that. It's so interesting to me because, I mean, Radiohead, they always foreshadowed this sort of concept, I think, of having two drummers because there's many songs in the past, too. For example, um, They're There, where Johnny and Ed are both playing, oh, yeah, right. playing yes, tom exactly. drums. Yeah. And even I remember watching a concert back in like 2008, it must have been. And, and Tom came to the front of the stage and grabbed a drum set. And I'm like, what is going on? And they, they introduced one of those songs, Bangers and Mash, which has become an obscure kind of B-side. But um, he was playing drum set for that. And I always sort of it, from that moment on, I sort of felt this inkling that they, they needed more for the percussion in the band. And uh, it just seemed like a sensible kind of trajectory, I guess, to just add a second you know, drummer to the touring lineup. And uh, it works, you know, fantastically well. And I really think that a lot of the songs, one of the things you touched on, which I'm so interested to hear from someone who's been actually working with the band is that willingness to create different versions of live songs than the album. 
Yeah, right. Because it would, in a way, be so boring to just hear the album live. I yeah, want. I mean, yeah, I want to hear the music that. where people used to do that, where they used to just yes. try to sort of present a carbon copy of the thing. And maybe you know, maybe for some people that that's that's a great thing. And it's you know, I'm not saying that's wrong, but but you know, again, because of them, you know, they they, they have this fearless. They're always pushing forward, you know, uh, and. Um, during sound checks on a tour with them you know if if we suddenly stumbled into some little alteration to something on one of the established songs and it, it felt good mm -hmm. there would immediately immediately be a discussion hey this this sounds good should we try that should we play that tonight well let's try it again tomorrow and if it still feels good maybe we'll put it in the set so you know that that's that's an interesting um uh, mindset that not all bands at that level would would do you know well, it keeps would, it exciting um because yeah, it keeps it fresh people, and well, yeah like i will go see radiohead when i can on a tour four or five times and people yeah. are you insane like why would you go watch a band well first of all the set looks different every night the songs are totally different energy than on the recordings um it's a real for a radiohead fan like it's a religious experience to go see the concerts and and you know take in the music in person but it's just that difference of the live energy um exactly what you're saying is just so I think it's a very special thing as you're right it's very unique but it's it's highly musical um almost like on another level though too to allow that to happen to the songs and still be recognizable of the song and, and not feel like ah oh, it's a scaled down this is just the live version this is the live version and yes it's different but it's also better in its own way they're both better in their own way you know absolutely I mean very when, hard when Tom's singing night to night will will differ hugely you know mm. uh, uh there are certain songs where you know that there are in odd time signatures for example uh, uh, a lot of people would tend to play it safe and sing the same thing to to to, to create some stability tom always takes uh liberties with the timing the phrasing of, of his own own lyrics um and i found that really uh exciting again for that track bloom yes which is this real sprawling jazz like thing um, well, bloom is exactly what we're talking about too it has a live version it has that album version doesn't it have like yeah. a drawn out version for some documentary like it's yeah. it's yeah, uh, right. very musical versions almost orchestral sounding um yeah. we worked with hans zimmer on that one i believe for um yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. crazy and so many versions and and that's one thing that came out with that that mini disc leak a few years ago too i remember listening to that and being astonished as a musician myself and songwriter to a limited ability, <laughs> um, just how many versions go through. And it made me feel so comforted as a musician to be like, ah, everyone goes through this. That's OK, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was so kind of interesting. But uh, so in another interview, you, you talked a little bit about when you were going to go on tour with the band, I think it was called Hawkwind. Um, <laughs> you, you had, you had to really quickly. Back in time now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had to really quickly get the catalog together. Um, and yeah. it was a rather rushed endeavor. Um, yeah. But I imagine that you did, of course, know of and appreciate Radiohead's music before you started working with them. So was it stuff that you'd already kind of integrated and you were just able to kind of go? Or was there a lot of rehearsal and um, the need to kind of really get into the music in that way? Or, or what was it like preparing for the, the tours? Are you talking about Hawkwind or Radiohead? <laughs> oh, I'm saying that when you mentioned Hawkwind, it was a very kind of rushed endeavor because I think you had to get ready uh, yeah, for three yeah, days. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what was the Radiohead experience like? Did you have only three days to prepare, and or was it weeks and weeks of preparation? Or... Oh, no, no, yeah, they, it was. They, they were, um, yeah, it was very uh, uh, sensibly put together uh, because, so the original proposition that was put to me was, we want to um, test out and then hopefully rehearse to do the performance of the material from the King of Limbs specifically for, exclusively for from the basement yes but what happened was is that during the process of doing doing the the rehearsal to prepare the material for, for that for that recording it became quite obvious in little little moments when you know t before or after a tea break or whatever you know or someone would start playing something and i would pick up on it or the other way around or whatever and it, it quickly became pretty obvious like well why don't we try, what would it sound like if we did such and such, you know, and pick us on from the back catalogue? And um, uh, it, 
it just built out from there. It just became obvious that, that with having two drummers, that suddenly there were other sort of musical gears available to the band. Um, and, and because I, you know, I, I was also quite happy to um, just use percussion instruments on certain things where me playing the kit would have been pointless. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've told the story many times, uh, Airbag, they rehearsed Airbag while I was there. And I noticed that Colin played the sleigh bell. If you go back to the <laughs> album, it's a sleigh bell. Yeah. I think this is really interesting. I've said it before. Usually when you pick up a sleigh bell, immediately everybody hears and imagines Santa Claus Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> when it's on yeah. that record, it does not make you think that because the guitar riff, da, 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 da. but the sleigh bell is chugging away. Ding, ding. So Colin used to pick it up for four bars or eight bars, and then put it down and he'd play the bass through the rest of the song. And then you pick it up again at the end. So I watched them do that in the rehearsal. So they finished it and I just said, oh, a suggestion, guys, would you like to run it again and I'll play the sleigh bell for you all the way through the track? And um, Tom said, yeah, yeah, try it. So sure enough. And we ran the thing. For me, it was hilarious to be chugging away on the sleigh bell sure. while in playing. Radiohead oh, playing it <laughs> yeah so I get to you know hear the song <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, for me it was fantastic to just be keeping time with that yeah. and to get through it and I think there was a you know there was, there was quite a bit of a little bit of laughter the fact that they finally performed it with the sleigh bell all the way in you know, all yeah the way yeah through. Well, this is an interesting production problem like you got so much going on and people are trying to scoop things up and yeah imagining suddenly that opens up a whole new soundscape for the, the live performance, which is actually probably quite exciting, even for them, I would I would think. Oh, yeah. And, and there were other moments similar to that, just simple things, like me playing a tambourine or me play, playing some maracas to add, you know, another, the same reason that you put it on when you do a recording. Yeah, it's yeah. sounded great, but shouldn't we put a tambourine there? Well, OK, yeah. <laughs> I think big deal. But it's amazing how much difference those in instruments can make, you know. Absolutely. And it's the same with it live, you know, if it's played with the right, with the right emphasis, it, it's amazing how much difference it can make. So this is kind of an odd question, but it's a listener question that came in. Um, from the perspective of the song videotape is notorious for having kind of this odd sort of hidden syncopation. Have you heard about this, yeah. this, yeah. <laughs> this, uh, this video? Um, I mean, the videotape, that track, I mean, I think because on the record, you've got this sort of uh, double, triple time thing where yeah, yeah. are sliding in times, out of time slightly with other things or starting at different points. It's like a, a series music thing. Mm -hmm. And so when you do that live, you, you have the, the, the challenge of deciding, well, okay, so how radical are we going to allow the time to be pushed and pulled around? Uh, and... Uh, so I, you know, Phil plays more or less the way he always used to play it, as far as I know. Mm. And my job was to kind of uh, mirror or play something almost the same as him. And, and I would anticipate it slightly or be slightly behind on purpose to try and create this kind of push and pull feeling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the danger when you do that is is that you can then end up with with a very, very you know we, we, you could musically be on, on on shifting sands obviously literally and the whole thing could fall apart and <laughs> become a bit of a car crash but so is that one of the songs you would find is more particularly difficult to play um, 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 yeah, well like i said i mean i, I i'm fairly used to doing stuff yeah, like I, yeah I guess you've done it hundreds of I'm, times and <laughs> yeah and it's not just about having rehearsed it it's the spirit of how you play it, it it's uh, knowing how much to push it there are certain Radiohead songs that for all of the band members, you have to be really switched on. You can't just start the song. Oh, I, know, I know how this goes and just kind of do it and be staring around the room while you play your way through it out of- I see, of, yeah, yeah. There are certain songs where there are rhythmic complexities going on between all of the instruments that if you, if you allow yourself to not focus and fall off of your understanding of where you are, you could easily trip everyone else up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there was quite a lot of songs that are in odd time signatures where there's very little information landing on the downbeats, where everything is syncopating in some kind of offbeat way. So your sense of where one is, the beginning of a bar, you can easily become lost because the references are scattered here, there and everywhere. <laughs> so 
Am I making it? I don't know if yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost as if that's the point, though, like for li the listener is to lose that downbeat and it gives it that interest. And I see yeah. what you're saying, though, that that is a hard spot to kind of keep involved with. So I, I think that there's um, it's interesting, though, because I, I do wonder why they then changed the set list so much, because I don't think they've ever played the same set list twice. Yeah, and I don't know how they I don't know exactly why, at what point they decided to do that. But I, I guess early on, it was that not wanting to be bored and not being boxed in and feeling like you have to just kind of go on stage like a bunch of performing monkeys and go yeah yeah them. well it's a smart decision it's it's always a really interesting thing to see different and you know i would if i ever get a chance to talk to some of the other members love to find out about how they structure the the set list and think about that because there's certain songs that seem to work better as openers obviously but sometimes they'll totally flip it up it's like wow okay <laughs> it well, works Again, you know, I, I play with a lot of different people and there's all different kind. There's so many different uh, reasons why you might put a set of, of musical material in a certain order. And there are there's no end of reasons as to why you would definitely not play this song as the opening tune. Yet mm -hmm. three gigs later, that could be exactly the right. Yeah, tune. yeah, I see. Yeah, because it's this particular audience in that particular venue on that particular night. Um, and there's an acoustic factor there. Who knows? There could be any number of reasons, you know, um, there are rules and there aren't any rules, you know, it's that <laughs> thing. And just when you think you can say, it should always be done this way. No, there's always another way of doing it. So a couple more listener questions here. I do want to get to these because I, I thank these people so much for sending them in. Um, this is kind of a two-part question, but how is your playing over involved? How has your playing evolved? I think they mean over time, and what is most important in a band: synergy or something else? So that's a very long question, but <laughs> maybe the latter part. I think we've talked about the former a bit. So um, my playing over so over time, we've talked about that a little bit already. But basically, yeah, I started off as a loud, a loud, um, uh, bombastic young rock drummer. Okay, showing off, playing too loud, and and you know, copying certain kinds of drummers, uh, rock drummers mostly, but always having a curiosity about lots of other music, particularly jazz, which I had I was clueless about when I started. When I discovered jazz and sort of had a rebirth, that began me on the path that accidentally led me to being useful to people like Porter's Head and then eventually Radiohead, and even Robert Plant which is the one of probably the, the funniest one of all because robert uh, what robert liked about my playing was its springy quality was the mm. word he would use but the funny connection is is that i remember when i was only uh playing jazz and blues as as a policy for a while i just sort of <laughs> didn't, didn't want to play any rock music or pop music i just wanted to play jazz and blues mm. and that's where i discovered the the drumming of earl palmer and that and that's when I realized what what um, pushed John Bonham's buttons, because I started to understand exactly the same things from the record. We both would, would have listened to the same tracks and were trying to do the same thing. And mm. then strangely, I end up working with Robert and having to play some of those Led Zeppelin tunes. It's like, you know, this, this, like squaring the circle. Uh, yeah. Earl Palmer is this connection for both of us, and um, so that's that's God. I don't know if I'm answering the question at all. It's so hard because as you get older and you've been playing a long time, it's such a lot. That there's such a a, a a a lot of strands that that affect why you do play in certain ways, and you forget the route that you've come. But yeah, I've gotten quieter and quieter, as I said. But I can still go all the way between super bombastic and to very very subtle. And that's what I, I I try to hang on to and I keep trying to develop that. This is so interesting because there's actually, I, I find a trend with musicians that as they, they you know, go through their career, they want to get quieter and slower. <laughs> I talked yeah. to uh, 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 Stanley Drucker, who was the um, principal Philharmonic, sorry, principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic, longest ever, I think 75 years or something like that. Um, but he said the same thing. I would like to, as he got older, he, he learned to play softer and slower and glenn gould the famous pianist said a similar thing um right. so all of us who are all of us who are you know <laughs> slow down i guess <laughs> because when you're young you yeah. haven't yet experienced the realization of the fact that when you're young you say a lot and you use a lot of energy 
Mm-hmm. But by the time you look back at that 10 years later, 20 years later, if someone puts a bit of footage of film of you as an 18 year old going, bah, bleh, running around saying all this stuff and doing all this, it'll be great. Some of it, some of it, you'll be really embarrassed. Oh, totally. Right. So are you, are you time, familiar with Glenn Gould, his two recordings of the Goldberg variations? I've heard them. Yeah. I, I'm not yeah. huge familiar with them, but you know. But that's um, one of the most exciting instances in music for me is you've got this really early, like 20 year old guy playing a through a whole piece. I will do that. And then years later, when he was 50, just before he died, he recorded it again, unrecognizable. I, I will check that, actually. Now that you've mentioned that, I'll do that. The two um, versions, yeah. And it's the same for me. So when I lis- listen back to things that I did, you know, so many years ago, and laugh at them and, and hear them as, as, oh, God, I was trying so hard to do this or hard to do that. What I should have done it was, it's like, 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 just being a human being, as you age, you learn to get your point across or to understand things because you have greater um, knowledge. You have greater ability to sort the good stuff from the the, the, the frippery, the, the nonsense, the fake. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I've got no idea what that question was now. There was... Part two was kind of about synergy. Like what makes a good band? Is it is it the, yeah. God, yeah, what makes a good band? Yeah. Um, of course, in this day and age, a band is a very different thing. You know, the old traditional bog standard lineup of a band was about having the right musicians who somehow fit together, that together makes a synergy. And obviously, they're a great, you know, Radiohead's a great example, Led Zeppelin, great example, um, where there was a magical quality that emerged only because those four or five people came together at the right time. But then great songwriting partnerships you know, usually that that thing where they're two different people, but together this magic happens. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it is very important uh, as it is in the studio when you're working with other musicians. If you can understand one another quickly and instinctively, great things can happen. Um, so yes, yeah, synergy is really important, obviously, um, and the synergy within yourself, understanding what it is you're trying to do when you play. Um, and how much of that is about maybe some technical things that you haven't mastered or is it more about what you haven't thought what you haven't imagined to do yet or what you what you haven't strived to, to do that you could do that you're scared of trying you know or undoing stuff that you're doing that's too much simplifying you know all those old uh, uh, things that all artists kind of struggle with Am I putting too much paint on this canvas or is it not enough? You know, should I only use two colors? Um, And sometimes those limits actually make it better, you know, you know, limiting it to two or three colors instead of a thousand. (laughs) But Jeff Jeff Tweedy said something similar in his book. I read just yesterday um, something about like try new things so you can get excited about music. You don't yet know you want to write. I thought that was really, really cool. Exactly. There you are. It's those really, really simple, basic things that are so easy to, and uh, overlook and, and, and forget those basic things exist because in, in our mad struggle to make our lives go where we think that they should go, you sometimes overlook some of the simple basic things that, that lie underneath the, the, uh, the, the, um, the surface. The surface, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Thank well, yeah. thank you so much, Clive. I uh, want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on the program today. Uh, of course, I have many, many more questions I could ask. We could go all afternoon, but I want to respect your time here. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much to all the listeners who sent in questions and for listening to this episode. You can check out more content at okpodcast.com. And again, just thank you, Clive, so much for taking the time to come on and chat with me today. My pleasure, Sean. I'm, uh, it's been nice talking to you.